Hello my lovely friends, my name is Ava and today we're going to be talking about the 12 books that I finished in the later half of March. I did read more than 12 books in the month of March. You can go check out my mid-month wrap-up which will be linked down below if you want to check out the books that I read before these 12. Anyway, uh, let's get into these 12 books. The first book that I have to talk about is Love at First Psych by Cara Bass Stone. I listened to this off of Audible. If you have an Audible membership, you're able to listen to, I believe, any of the books in the series. And I love this series. I love Cara Bass Stone's writing style. I think I've almost read all of her backlist. I think I have like two more books to read by her, but I love her. And these graphic audios are just everything. They are kind of like the A Quarter Thrones and Roses graphic audios where you have background noise, sound effects. There are different narrators for each character. Like it was wonderful. This series is such a joy to listen to. So I definitely recommend this series as a whole. Our two main characters in this book are Marigold and Robbie. And they're two unconventional students, if you will. They decided to go to college a little bit later on in their life compared to typical college students who go directly after graduating high school. I believe they started college in their mid to late uh, 20s. They've been paired together to work on this psych project together revolving around love at first sight and they're going to be interviewing couples to just learn more about love at first sight and whether or not I guess it exists. So the story happens through the voice recordings they have to record throughout these interviews and sometimes the recorder stays on longer than they anticipated and um yeah. <laughs> this is about Robbie Marigold possibly falling for each other during this project. I thought this was just a fun read. The audiobook definitely enhanced my enjoyment of it. I thought it's like a it's like a piece of art listening to these types of audiobooks. I really enjoyed these two main characters. However, it's not my favorite book in the series. It might be my least favorite in the series, but I still really enjoyed this one. Like just because it's not my favorite doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it. I gave it a solid four stars. I just kept comparing it to like um what's the second one? Sweet sweet something sweet talk I just kept comparing it to that one because that one's like my favorite and I was like that one was like perfect and then comparing it to this one it just like didn't hold a candle to me so that's why it is a four star for me but it was still a very enjoyable read for tropes in this one this is a college set romance it's a foodie romance the heroine in here loves to bake and cook treats and stuff so I love that part of it um, there is great banter and it's opposites attract. And again, I gave this one four out of five stars. Next is unfortunately a disappointing read. I ended up picking up Awaken Me Darkly by Gina Showalter. I have now learned that this author is not for me. This is the second book that I read by her. She's just not it. She's a paranormal romance author and I want to get into her books, but I don't think they're for me. You couldn't tell by the cover probably, but this isn't alien romance series. Um, I picked this one up because I was looking for alien romances that star a heroine who is an alien because normally you get the heroes that are aliens instead of the heroine. So I read on I think like a Goodreads list that this has an alien heroine in it and I was like perfect let's pick it up. I have it on Libby. Let's do it. And I loved everything about this book except the romance. This book takes place on earth but in the future there's like futuristic technology devices which is really cool. There's like hover cars, flying cars, like it was really cool. But now on earth, um, aliens have like inhabited earth too and they live with humans. However, there are those aliens that are violent towards humans. And so there's a group of detectives and cops that are there specifically to hunt down dangerous aliens. That's what our he heroine is a part of. She's a part of that uh, group of cops, if you will. She has like some special abilities. She doesn't know where they came from. She might be an alien and she doesn't know it, okay? <laughs> and um, she's trying to track down this specific alien and this other alien comes in and tries to like help her with it. The romance was not it. I feel like for the two Gina Showalter books I have read, like it's like a switch is flipped and they're in love. I did not see how they fell in love with each other. Like, why are you in love with this person? What happened? Like, I did not see that at all in both of the books that I've read, especially this one. So I literally wrote in my review, I wrote one line. I said, I loved everything about this book, literally except for the romance. And it's a romance book. I feel like I should love the romance more than anything. The world building, the setting, the, the culture that this book, like the author created in this book, fantastic. I loved the alien lore and everything. The romance, not it. I gave it like a 2, 2.5 out of 5 stars. Next, I have Claiming His Mate by H.E. Wild. I actually posted a um, one of my graphic posts 
on Instagram. I did like a collection of romance books with disability representation and A.G. Wilde wrote like commented on the post. I love A.G. Wilde by the way. She commented on my post saying, oh my gosh, my new series that I just came out with, every single book in the series is centered around a heroine who has a disability. And I was like, what? I love your book so much. How did I not know about this? So I picked up book one. Like other A.G. Wilde books that I've read, this book is sweet and cute when it comes to the romance, but there is some gory, messed up stuff like in the book itself okay this gets like it's like one of those books that you read that gets dark but it also has like sweet soft elements to it it's like a very strange combination but i think ag wild does it phenomenally well so marion i believe that's the heroine's name in here she and other human women think that they've won this like lottery ticket to go on a all expenses paid like space cruise however they don't know that they were tricked by their government. When Marion gets on the ship, she's like, huh, everyone else also has a physical disability. Why are only women with physical disabilities on this spaceship? Like, that's kind of strange to me. Like, what? why did we all get picked? The women have no clue that their government <laughs> tricked them and made a agreement with an alien like race in exchange for like, I think their protection or goods or something. And as a sign of good faith, they would give them like a bunch of human women. And the reason why they picked Marriott and all these other women is because they have disabilities and they think that they would not be a contributor to human society anymore. So they picked disabled human women to be shipped to aliens to potentially be brides because they didn't want them in their population anymore. Like, messed up. They get overrun by some evil aliens and the whole ship gets like massacred blood gore dead bodies like everywhere it gets bloody okay like it it was like tragic like ag wild does that in her books like you have this giant travesty that happens in her books but then it turns into something sweet because the hero in here is from the alien race that is gonna like receive the human women they don't know that the women don't know that they're there not willingly um and so when he gets on the ship like fuck, there's all these dead bodies and he's like distraught he's like all these people died like he's distraught he checks the video cameras for like the spate the the feed on the ship to figure out what happened four women which i guess each book in the series is going to be about one of these women were taken hostage so our heroine here marion is one of those women that were taken hostage and so when he sees her on the feed he's like utterly entranced by her and is like i need to go save that woman so he goes and tracks down marion to try and find her this couple was really sweet together like like i said it gets very gory and grotesque but then it turns very sweet because the two characters were really sweet with each other and really like fell for each other i loved how persistent the hero was very respectfully obviously like he just knew that marion was destined to be his and like he wasn't gonna let her go like he just knew it um there was i feel like a huge tone shift with the beginning and like the end portion like i said before with the dark and then the light i kind of wanted more of a bridge there um but i didn't think like it negatively affected the book. I just felt like it would have added to the book if there was more of like a a bridge arcing the dark from the light. There's trigger warnings in here for death, blood, gore, massacres, ableism, and kidnapping. Uh, tropes, alien romance, fated mates. There's disability representation because the heroine was born with only one arm. And there is like the savior trope, the hero goes to save the heroine. I ended up giving this book 3.75 out of five stars just because of that bridge aspect again. And I wanted a little bit more development with the romance. I feel like it happened a little too fast, but these books are pretty short, so. Next, I ended up reading Sweet Berries by C.M. Nascosta. I don't know if this author is for me. And I feel bad saying that because Sam Costa is one of these staple monster romance authors out there. Like everyone loves her books and I just think they're okay. Like I don't love them necessarily. I'm not gonna lie, I even DNF'd Morning Glory Milking Farm because I was bored. <laughs> like I don't know if this author is for me and I feel bad. Like I want to love her books but I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so Sweet Berries was fine. I gave it three stars. It's a romance between a human woman and a mothman. It was just fine. I was bored, honestly. I, I don't really know what to tell you. Like, I know, like, all my friends have given this book, like, five or four stars. I'm just like, I was bored. And I feel bad because I want to like her books. Next book I ended up reading is His Wicked Seduction by Lauren Smith. It's the second book in the League of Rogues series. This is an age gap uh, brother's best friend romance. 
and I thought this one was just okay. I gave it 3.5 out of 5 stars. I felt like the age gap, I'm never really someone to like nitpick an age gap, but for me, this one was just a little bit eh to me with the age gap aspect. Horatia um, is significantly younger than I think his name's Lucian. It jumps to flashbacks when she's literally like 12 and claims that she's in love with him and he's like 24 or something. I didn't like those scenes where she was literally a child claiming to be in love with him and stuff. And then it jumps now when they're like, it just, it, I felt like it was weird to me. I'm normally not like that with age gaps. I've read age gaps that are larger than that. I feel like it was like the flashback scenes that take place when she's a kid that kind of like threw me off. I don't know. This one just like wasn't my favorite book. Um, but the third book in the series is on my TBR for April. And if I don't like that book, I think Lawrence Smith is going to be a no-no for me because I think both book in the series, both books in this series, I've given like three or 3.5 stars too. So next I ended up reading A Nanny for the Reclusive Billionaire by Regina Kyle. You can know my thoughts on this one in a nanny romance reading vlog that's going to be linked down below. I filmed that and posted it in March. So you can go check that out if you want to know my thoughts on that one. Then I ended up reading a Jessica Kane book. I heard Rachel from Richard and Sings like raving about this book and one for videos I watched. I don't remember which one it was. I, I watched all of Rachel's videos. So um, this is Making Their Vows by Jessica Kane. She loves this one. It's one of her favorite Jessica Kane books. And uh, I love Jessica Kane too. And so I had to pick it up. This one I feel like is the epitome of love at first sight. So if you want to read an actually like good love at first sight novella, I feel like this one is great for you. It's not like insta love. It's like, it's love at first sight. Like Truly. Grace and a few of her friends end up going to like this underground fight club for a night or something. And right when she sees the man on the ring named North, she is utterly obsessed with him. And from the moment North sees her, he is obsessed with her also. So this is the love at first sight romance between North and Grace, but there is like a big um like social class difference. Grace comes from the wealthier side of town and North comes from the horror side of town honestly um so he feels like he's not good enough for grace in certain aspects but he's never gonna give her up like <laughs> like he knows that he's not good enough for grace but it doesn't matter because he's obsessed with her and she was made for him like i love heroes like that so i absolutely was obsessed with how devoted the hero was loved him their chemistry was also just explosive right off the page the moment that they locked eyes with each other for the first time it was everything um for tropes you have social class difference it's on Kindle Unlimited, Love at First Sight. You have a possessive hero, it's a novella, and you're dealing with like a sports romance because he is like an underground fighter that does take a role in the book. I gave this book four out of five stars. Then I ended up reading Irresistible by Melanie Harlow. You can again check out that nanny romance reading vlog that will be linked down below if you wanna know my in-depth thoughts and my rating for this book. Next, I read The Arc for Fractured Souls by Neva Altaj. This book is already out by this point. It came out, I believe, like a few days ago for me. And this is book number six in the Perfectly Imperfect series. This is a mafia romance series. This book is definitely the darkest by Neva and she even puts a preface at the beginning of this book saying normally her books have that darker mafia element to it. However, you have those little moments of hilarity and moments where you can laugh um, in her other books. But she specifically said in this book in the preface part like you will not get that in this book because it would be just not appropriate to add those funny elements in here because the story is that serious and deals with very serious topics. So this book gets dark. This book is very serious. Um, there's even on page SA. So just please be aware of that before going into this book. This is about 18 year old Aza. Um, and she was kidnapped a few months ago and has been living in the, her version of hell for I think like a couple months, five months. She was kidnapped and then sold into basically a sex trafficking ring and has been forced to take drugs to keep her mind out of it. Like it, it gets dark, okay? So at the beginning of this book, she sees an opportunity to run away and she takes it. She's literally naked and finds this opportunity to just bolt. She bolts out the door, is running down the road, no clothes on because she finds this as the only opportunity for escape and she almost gets hit by our hero's car. His name is Pasha and yeah, he almost hits her with his car. She blacks out right when he sees her and turns out she's having a drug overdose because she was drugged by these people. And he takes her back to his mafia people. He's part of the Russian mafia and brings her back home to hopefully take care of her. And when she wakes up to send her on a merry way back home. But then when she wakes up, uh, he realizes that this girl has gone through 
a lot. Pasha becomes her safe haven of sorts. Like she clings to him for dear life. And Pasha, his whole life has lived a life of solitude. I believe he grew up in like the foster care. Like he's had no one in his life ever. So it's kind of a bit of a culture shock when this woman comes into his life that is completely totally dependent on him. And so he ends up falling in love with her. And then the fact that like, she's able to fill that hole in his life. So he's determined to hunt down the man that kidnapped her, that assaulted her, that traumatized her. Like that is his main goal in life. And to also help Asha like, heal her wounds and to grow from her trauma. This book was really, really gripping. I flew through it. There were, however, some points that I did have to put it down because it got a little bit, a little bit graphic, but I did love the connection and the love I got to see between these two characters. I thought it was beautiful. And just them individually growing as people. Both of them really grew individually just because they knew the other person. Pasha was there to just show her how strong and capable and amazing she is as a woman despite what she's gone through and what her body has gone through. So like what she's been through just doesn't define her as a person. Her trigger warning series on page SA of the female main character, but not by the hero. Um, forced drugging, overdose, PTSD, and violence. I have a few memorable quotes on my Goodreads review if you wanna go check those out, but I'll read one of them for you. This one I really loved. He saved me and not only my life, he saved my soul too. He helped me collect all my broken pieces and glued them back together. Tropes, you have age gap, caretaking scene. He like washes her hair in one scene. Oh, I love those scenes where the hero washes her hair. Like, yes. Um, character with glasses, the heroine has glasses. Like a damaged heroine, mafia, possessive hero, savior trope, a tattooed hero, toucher and die vibes for sure. And definitely the who did this to you statement gets said in this book. I give this one 4.5 out of 5 stars. Next I read Focus by Carla Sorensen. This is the first book in the War Sisters series, which is a spinoff to the Washington Wolf series. I do recommend reading these books in order, by the way. Like, do it. Like, read the Washington Wolf series first and then this series. I tried reading this one before reading Washington Wolves and I was kind of lost and DNF'd it. So this is me trying to read it again and I finished it this time. <laughs> Molly is a heroine in here and she's been tasked to work with this like Amazon filming crew following one of the football players that is on the Washington Wolves football team. And it just so happens to be uh, Noah and they have a little bit of a history. You get to read about it in the third book in the Washington Wolves series. They were actually next door neighbors when he was in college and she was in high school and they had a little happenstance that didn't really leave them on amicable terms at all. And so this is about the two of them getting to know each other again all those years later and ending up falling in love with each other. There is a forbidden aspect because she signed this like clause saying that she wouldn't be with any of the players so there's like that forbidden aspect to it this is a cute contemporary romance like i just felt like this wasn't like memorable you know there were like good moments in this book and then there were just moments that were like okay like this is fine i think i was talking to victoria about this because we were voice memoing about this book because i know she loves carl swords and i was like it was a good book i just feel like all these contemporary romances i've been reading like they're contemporary romances they're fine. They're good. Like there's just nothing special to them. Like I feel like they don't hold a candle to like the alien paranormal monster fantasy romance as I read where there's like faded mates involved. Like I'm like, does not hold a candle to me? You know, it just doesn't. And I shouldn't compare books like that, but I just can't help it in my brain. Like it just happens subconsciously. So yeah, this one was fine. I gave it a 3.75 stars. I will say I did love like his plan to grovel at the end. I really liked that part of it, but overall it was just like, Okay, nothing bad about it, like at all. It's just like, the mood I'm in is just not a contemporary romance mood apparently. For tropes in this one, you have football, sports, forbidden, and a groveling scene. Again, I gave this one 3.75 out of five stars. Next, I have a reread. This is The Year We Fell Down by Serena Bowen. I reread this book. Okay, I think I read this book for the first time. Let me look, in 2019? Yes, 2019. And when I first read it, I gave it 4.5 stars. I have decided to revoke my rating and I'm not going to be rating this book anymore. I don't know what I would rate it. I don't even want to think about it, but I'm not rating this book anymore. I really enjoyed this book. I remember when I first read it back in 2019, I have like fond memories for it. I was like, this is a good book with disability representation. It's great. It's about a heroine who got in a ice hockey injury because she's a hockey player and uh, she is now in a wheelchair and she goes to college for the first time. It's a freshman year of college. She gets put in a dorm room, um, like kind of like the accessible dorm building um, for people with disabilities or injuries. And across the hall from her in her dorm room is, um, what's his name? 
Adam? Is his name Adam? Adam. His name's Adam. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Adam is there because he got into injury too, but it's like a temporary injury. Um, he also plays hockey. And yeah, it's about the two of them falling for each other. He has a girlfriend, by the way, just letting you know. He has a girlfriend, like the majority of this book. And I've also like grown in my taste with like romance books and reading. And my least favorite form of conflict is other woman drama. Like least favorite form of conflict ever. But my main issue with this book was some of the language used in here involving people who are disabled. There's some honest like ableist language and slurs like used in here. But upon further reflection and talking to some of my friends about this book, this book was written during a time when like people use those words like, you know, um, so we've definitely like, grown as a society and grown as people to figure out what is okay and what is not okay to say about people who are disabled. I just remember reading this book and listening to some of the, because I listened to it, uh, listening to some of the words that these characters were using to describe people with disabilities. And I was like, how did I not notice this the first time around? Like those are not okay things to, to say, but I read this back in 2019. I've also grown in my identity as a disabled person and learned more about what is okay and what is not okay to say, you know? And I guess I'm also more sensitive to words like that. So I just was like shocked that I loved this book so much because like those words definitely put like a bad taste in my mouth. This book was also written many years ago and I believe Serena Bowen did have like sensitivity readers who like identify with these main characters when she wrote the book. So like, I don't fault the book for that. This was written in a different time period, even though it was only like over maybe six years. I don't know, six years ago, maybe, I don't know. But like, this was written in a different time. I don't blame Serena Bowen. I don't blame the book for it. It just, this book just isn't a favorite for me anymore. And I'm not gonna bash the author for writing a book like this because again, this was written in a time period where people didn't know that those words were not okay to say. You know, like we've grown as a society, as people, as a community, I feel like we're also more aware. And again, I think I'm also just highly sensitive to words like that and language use like that. So I'm just like, I just rather wouldn't rate it. And I don't think I'm gonna be like talking about this book anymore, which is sad, but I do love other Serena Bowen books. But like, I just, those words put like a bad taste in my mouth. So, and the last book that I have to mention is More Than Words by Mia Sheridan. I finally read this one. This one has been on many TBRs, but it got on my hold on like Libby on a whim. I was like, you know what? Let's, let's pick it up. Let's do it. I feel like this book is an embodiment of a childhood friends to estranged to lovers, you know, like to being estranged to lovers. Um, I feel like this book is like the epitome of that. This is about Callan and Jessica. And when they were kids, they both had really poor home lives, poor home situations. And they turned to each other as kids as like a shining beacon, a shining star in the other person's life. But their friendship ends when one day and for many days after, one of these characters doesn't show up at their meeting spot anymore. And the other one is devastated. Technically they're both devastated, but they don't know, like they don't know why the other person didn't show up. So this book takes place years later when both of them are grown up and it takes place in Paris of all places. That's where they meet each other again. Callan is now a famous composer and um, Jessica, is trying to live out her life's dream of being a like a language translator, specifically in France. She's always dreamed of working in France. But Kellen has been living with certain demons in his head since he was a child. It's affecting him really badly. When he runs into Jessica again, that shining light comes back into his life and he's trying to become the man he's always wanted to be because Jessica's now in his life again. And she's the only person that's been able to keep those demons at bay for him. So she just becomes this safe haven for him. I could not get enough of Mia Sharon's writing when I read this book. Like I kept wanting to read it and read it. I was listening to it. The audiobook was fantastic by the way. So I really recommend that if you want to listen to it. I normally do not care for the celebrity like fame trope in here, but I honestly didn't mind all that much in this book because it wasn't like a giant prevalent part of the story. And Callan wasn't necessarily my favorite character because he was so self-destructive and I personally don't care for characters who are that self-destructive but i did love watching his growth in here i did i did really enjoy that there's also a separate storyline jessica is translating a work revolving around the time of joan of arc and there's a side 
plot line of romance going on here where she's translating these works during that time and there's this romance being translated and it is beautiful like I want a story about that I feel like Mia Sheridan should write a historical romance about like that time period because I felt like she did an amazing job with that but like I loved that part of the book in here too just that little those little hints of storyline in there I loved it for trigger warnings in here you have childhood abuse alcohol abuse ableism depression childhood trauma for representation Callan has a learning disability um, for tropes, there's a celebrity or fame trope, childhood friends, a tortured hero, musician, set in Paris, and this is a second chance romance. I ended up giving this book a four out of five stars. Anyways, there you have it. Those are the 12 books that I ended up reading in the later half of March. Please let me know down below if you've read any of these books or if you plan to. I would love to know, but if you don't feel like commenting any of those things, you can leave me... Let's see. Leave me the... Is there an Eiffel Tower emoji? Let's do that one. <laughs> Eiffel Tower emoji in the comment section down below. But anyways, thank y'all so, so much for watching. I will see y'all soon in my next one. Bye y'all.